Center for Human Rights and Development. Before joining PCHRD in December 2011, she worked as the media coordinator for the Bureau of His Holiness the Dalai Lama in New Delhi, as well as the research and media officer at Tibetan Women's Association. She has worked as an editorial assistant at Tibetan Review Journal, one of the first English language journals started by Tibetan refugees in India. She was one of the earliest members of the Network of Asia Pacific Youth, a network of youth activists working for youth and women empowerment in the Asia Pacific region. She's a trained journalist and her writings have appeared in Asia Times Online, Daily Pioneer, The Sikkim Observer, Border Affairs, and other exiled Tibetan publications. She was born to Tibetan refugee parents and was raised in India. Uh, she finished her schooling from Tibetan Home School in North India, obtained her bachelor's degree and, di and a diploma in journalism from the Delhi University, and completed a master's degree in journalism from New York University. Vivi Rajagopal, known as Rajaji, is from a Gandhian family and, schooling, and was schooled in South India. He came to the northern part of India in 1970 during Mahatma Gandhi's 100th birth century. Rajaji began his work on nonviolence. He undertook educational and rural development activities in Chambal region to reestablish peace. As a result, large numbers of rural youth motivated, were motivated when he spent six years working um, with them in, in the Chambal region of India. He moved to the Gandhi Ashram in the state of Nagaland, northeast border of India, to promote village industries to create employment for Naga youth, as well as to promote peace in the region. From here, he spent the next 15 years building the capacity of rural youth through training programs and different initiatives. In 1993, he became the secretary of the Gandhi Peace Foundation and subsequently was the vice chair actively engaged in a process of peacemaking in areas where armed conflicts were going on. In the mid-90s, he worked to galvanize a mass movement called the Ekta Parishad to promote the concept of people as main players in democracy, nonviolent action for socioeconomic change, and people's capacity to make the state accountable. Our next, our fourth speaker, Bhakta Bishwakaram, is a national president of the Nepal National Dalit Social Welfare or Organization, a first registered and largest Dalit organization in Nepal. He's well recognized as a Dalit human rights activist working in Nepal for the last 20 years. He's the founder and chair of Legal Rights Protection Society, the first organization of Dalit lawyers in Nepal. He has been engaged in advocacy and lobbying the UN and EU with a strong association with the International Dalit Solidarity Network and has a strong passion about his work and dedication toward the protection and promotion of the rights of marginalized Dalit people and building inclusive democracy in Nepal. The last but not the least of our speakers is Shireen Xavier. She's the director for the, for the Home for Human Rights in Sri Lanka a position she has held since 2007. Prior to this appointment, she was the head of delegation of the Canadian Red Cross Society in India, a post she held little over three years after serving as national coordinator of the Promotion of Humanitarian Values Program of CS CRCS in Ottawa, Canada. Um, her earlier positions include program director for Fourth World Vision, executive director for Home for Human Rights in Sri Lanka, and worked in Toronto and Montreal, Canada with the South Asian Women's Organizations. She has served as a consultant to a wide range of international organizations over the last 20 years, including the American Refugee Committee, the Asian Development Bank in Sri Lanka and India, Oxfam UK, the World Bank, and the UNDP in Sri Lanka. Presently, she's producing a docudrama on realities of post-war Sri Lanka. So um, the panel, We'll want to look now at natural resources and land as major economic assets for communities to meet their basic needs and human rights. However, uh, there, are, there have been negative impacts in various forms of so-called development projects by transnational governments, sorry, transnational corporations, governments, as well as individuals, acquisition of these resources and land. The panelists, therefore, from the five countries will discuss in detail 
those impacts on marginalized communities in their respective countries and share the struggles and responses to these challenges. So um, we will begin now from, from my right, right to from my left to the end of the table. So we begin with Heng of Cambodia. Good morning, everyone. My name is Heng Takadai. I'm from Dentio Forum on Cambodia. Dentio Forum on Cambodia is basically a membership organization. We have about 100 member local and international NGO working together on a number of uh, development issues affecting Cambodia. And one of the programs that uh, we work on is land and livelihood, which we look at the access to uh, land, uh, indigenous people, right, housing, and resettlement, right. So this morning, I have the pleasure to share with you uh, an overview of the land dispute in Cambodia, and then present two case study, two specific case study to have to, to let you have uh, an idea of what the situation is like in in Cambodia. So to start with, uh, land security is a major issue in Cambodia. 80% uh, of the population live in the rural area and 90% of whom work in the agriculture sector. And as we all know that uh, land is the most important asset in the agriculture sector. But over the past 15 years, we have seen that violation of uh, land rights has been uh, very widespread. In fact, more than half, half a million people are actually affected by uh, land dispute over the country. Just to give you an, an overview of how widespread land dispute cases in Cambodia are, I'd like to invite you to have a look at this map. This basically track the frequency of land dispute cases across the country over the past 14 years. So the darker the red color, the more frequent the, the land dispute cases are. So you can see that land dispute happen almost half of the half of the country. And if you look at by <coughs> By year, we can see that starting from uh, 1994, the number of land dispute has uh, increased uh, steadily. And what is troubling is that uh, almost half of the land dispute remain unresolved. So that means that old cases have not been completed, and then additional new cases were added up. So just for example, in 2014 alone, about 50,000 individuals were affected by the new cases of uh, land dispute. One of land issues are caused by a, a variety of reasons, but one of the major reasons that cause land issues is that uh, the government has been giving a lot of economic land concession to a private uh, company with some time overlap with the agricultural land of, uh, of the villager. So this is another map which show how big is the economic land concession in Cambodia. So the red color represented in the map are the concession granted uh, in the past uh, decade to a private company. Uh, I think a few years ago, the Global Witness uh, published a controversial report titled Cambodia, a country for sale, to reflect how much of the economic land concession were actually given to private company on the consequences, at the consequences of uh, the villager, and as a result of this, uh, publication global witness were kicked out of the country by uh, the government at that time. So the problem with uh, uh, ELC or economic land concession is that they have to meet certain criteria before they, uh, each company is given a concession. And some of these criteria include that the land must be classified and registered as state pri private land because state public land cannot be leased or concession to anyone. And second criteria is that a land must uh, there must be a plan. The company must have a plan and submitted and approved by the provincial and municipal state land committee. And the environment and in social impact assessment must be completed before uh, the project begin. And there must be a solution for resettlement issue and there should be no involuntary uh, settlement. And finally, public consultation must take place between uh, relevant stakeholders, especially the affected uh, community. In addition, the law also states that ELC may not be greater than 10,000 hectares uh, per project. Those stats are what the law say, but in reality, in practice, most of the things that listed law here have, been, have often been ignored. So I'm going to give you two specific cases and to see how these uh, laws were often taken for granted or are not uh, being implemented in, in reality. One of the first cases that I'd like to highlight you is the case of Bangkok uh, Development Project. 
So Bengka is basically the largest natural lake in Phnom Penh and one of the last uh, green area in the capital. The original plan is to use this lake as a national uh, public park. But then in, nine, in 2007, the, the lake and the surrounding area were leased to a private company uh, called uh, Sukaku, which is owned by a powerful uh, senator, which is a close uh, friend to the prime minister. So the land was leased for 99 years to this company for the price of seven seven to nine uh, million dollar, and the company will use this area to build high-end residential, commercial, and uh, tourism uh, conflict. So a year after the company was awarded the concession in 2008, the company started filling up the lake so that they can start building the foundations and stuff. And these uh, filling up caused serious flooding in the surrounding village, which affect about 4,200 uh, family living in that area. So this is the map of the lake from top after it is completely filled by uh, sand. Okay? So here is the picture of a uh, resident's uh, house which was uh, completely submerged by water after uh, the company filled it the land. So uh, 3,500 families have been forced to accept the compensation. They have to, if, even if they don't want to, they don't, they don't have any place to live since their house were, were completely flooded already. So they, they were forced to accept the compensation and reallocate to somewhere else. And this case uh, has been categorized as the largest single forced uh, relocation of, in Cambodian uh, history for the past uh, 20 years. So there has been a lot of uh, advocacy work from the community. Uh, those in the process were taken place, but each protest were met with threat of arrest and uh, excessive uh, force of uh, sexual use of force by the local authority and private security. In fact, one of the activists called uh, Teb Vani, a very well-known land activist, and her team were actually arrested and charged for two years in prison, but later were released uh, with the intervention from the international community. So after many protests and protests, the government finally agreed to allocate about 12 hectares of land within the development project to the remaining 17% of the village, the villagers who refuse to move, uh, so they, this, they can live within the within the, the development project. But the thing is that while most of the remaining villagers have been granted land tax so far, still a number, a small number of them uh, were still excluded uh, from from this uh, agreement. So that's one case. Uh, another case I'd like to highlight concerning the Union Development Group uh, development project in uh, a, a coastal area called uh, Gok Gong in our, in our country. So the project was developed by uh, Tianjin Union Development Group, and it was granted a 36,000 hectare concession. Like I mentioned earlier, the largest allowed uh, number is 10,000 hectare, for, but the, for this uh, specific project, for some reason, it went ahead even though the number was three times the limit uh, given allowed by the government to develop a mega tourism project. And in addition to that, in addition to the 36,000, about nine more thousand hectares were, were concession uh, as an addition to the firm to build the hydropower dam to power this uh, mega city development plan. So the, the concession was uh, located in five communes in uh, Potom Sako, Kirisako district uh, in uh, uh, province and this affect about a thousand family. To illustrate uh, the consequences, the effect of this development project for Cheng, I'd like to invite you to watch a short video clip, about five minutes, uh, to see how this project have uh, played out. Okay. This is the into the largest tourist hub in all of Southeast Asia over the next 25 to 30 years. The wrong secretive firm that has come under fire for its role in the forced eviction of more than 1,000 families is now ready after years of silence to answer those accusations and reveal more of its plans for its colossal concession. From the company's chopper, you get a sense of the staggering scale of the development and the mass relocation project to make room for it. We are going to build hotels, resorts, commercial centers, airports, 
uh, big sea port, highway, hospitals, schools, everything. But the company's grand plans have not been so well received by long-time residents, who have been forced off their land to make way for the project. Last month, some of them took their frustration to the company's gates in a futile attempt to block construction materials from entering the site. On the other side of the fence, it's a much more tranquil scene. In a closely guided tour, Union Development Group showed off some of the luxury facilities that have already been built, a tiny fraction of their $3.8 billion master plan. Though still light on specifics, Union Development Group say they will build thousands of hotel rooms, at least two 18-hole golf courses, an international airport, a hydropower dam, and have already begun construction on a port. Our port will start operating next year. The maximum of the vessel can go in is 10 to 12,000 tons only. To make way for all of this, the company was granted a 36,000 hectare concession in 2008 and another 9,000 hectares afterwards for the dam. That means communities here, many of them who live off the sea and have lived on this land for decades, have to go. And while Union Development Group say they're investing about $10 million in relocating them fairly by building houses, schools, markets and wells, NGOs say there is a vast gulf between what is pledged and what is delivered. Thanks, the, the moderator signaled to me that my time is up, so uh, I'd like to end my video here, and maybe you can ask me a question regarding the follow-up. This video was made last year, but I have some additional information uh, regarding the, this case, uh, so if you're interested to know, I'm in the panel and I welcome all the questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ken. We'll hear now from Serene Filmo of Tibet. Hello. Uh, thank you, Corina. I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to speak about the experiences uh, and challenges uh, faced by the Tibetan nomads in particular, because this is a vast subject, and I'm not sure how I'm going to tackle this with full justice within 10 minutes. Uh, but um, first of all, I uh, think that it is very important uh, to give uh, an overview, a short overview of why uh, nomadic lifestyle or nomadic uh, uh, livelihood is important for the uh, sustainable use of the Tibetan plateau and resources, natural resources. Because many of us, uh, because I had to revise my presentation after meeting uh, many of the participants because Majority of you uh, come from settled communities where agriculture is the dominant, uh, you know, source of livelihood. Um, and uh, I don't blame you actually because the Chinese government has been dealing with the Tibetans uh, for the past uh, more than uh, 50 years, and they even they don't understand the pastoral livelihood, why it is important, and that's why we have. Uh, uh, government-sponsored uh, uh, scientists uh, working in a laboratory uh, far away from the Tibetan grasslands in a, in a laboratory uh, located in Beijing, for instance. Uh, so uh, I don't know how, uh, um, you know, how, uh, uh, you know, uh, I don't think that they can do full justice to, uh, to understanding the grassland dynamics. Uh, why uh, nomadic livelihood is important for the survival of the Tibetan ecosystem, the rich, uh, really unique biodiversity that is, uh, you know, uh, that is there on the Tibetan plateau, and how it affects, uh, um, you know, more than 1.3 billion Asian uh, population. 
uh, that's why uh, let me give a, a brief overview. Um, the grasslands of the Tibetan Plateau cover an area of 1.65 million square kilometers out of total 2.5 million square kilometers. So when we talk about Tibetan Plateau, the uh, you know size of the Tibetan Plateau is uh, total, it's 2.5 million square kilometers. Now we are talking about 1.65 million square kilometers of uh, rich Tibetan grasslands that the uh, nomads of Tibet have relied on for, uh, you know, thousands of years for their livelihood, uh, for their cultural survival even. Uh, the Tibetans form less than 1% of the total population of the People's Republic of China. Um, yet, the area that the Tibetans occupy, the Tibetan Plateau, is uh, more than one quarter of the size of the People's Republic of China. So we can see the total uh, area size of the Pe People's Republic of China is 9.6 million square kilometers. Out of that, 2.5 mil uh, million uh, square kilometers uh, are uh, you know, located in the Tibetan, on the Tibetan plateau. So land uh, has become a very precious asset for the governments. Uh, uh, for the Ch Chinese government, and also because of the fact that China and also India is n are now two of the uh, fastest growing economies in the world, so there are lots of uh, common issues faced by both the countries. Uh, also, the Tibetan Plateau is a source of major rivers that flow into India, Bangladesh, China, Nepal, Pakistan, Thailand, Myanmar, and Vietnam. With more than 46,000 glaciers, on the Tibetan Plateau, um, the Tibetan Plateau provides freshwater resource to billions in Asia, and uh, to put it in exact figures, it's approximately 1.3 billion Asians who drink Tibetan water daily. So uh, we can see the, uh, uh, you know, the global consequences of what is happening on the Tibetan Plateau, that uh, there are lots of things that we can do together uh, to, to advocate for the rights of not only the Tibetan nomads, but this is something that we owe for the future generations on this uh, Asian uh, continent. So, uh, and also Asia has the largest number of populations. So you can uh, imagine, you know,